Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Hope you guys are all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's video. Today we're gonna be talking about the case of six-year-old Rosie Tapia. This is another highly requested case and I do just wanna put a quick warning out there that this case is very disturbing and graphic, so it's gonna be a hard one to listen to, but it's definitely an important case to know about. So yeah, that's pretty much what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. If you guys are new here, welcome, bienvenidos. I hope you guys are able to join the familia by hitting the subscribe button down below. All right, you guys, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys again so much for being here and watching today's video and listening to Rosie's story. All right, enough chit chatter. Let's jump right into today's video. So Rosie Tapia was a six-year-old little girl from Salt Lake City, Utah. Her parents are Luin and Roberto Tapia, and she has two older stepsisters named Emilia and Esmeralda, as well as four-year-old twin siblings. She lived in a basement-level apartment at the Salt Lake City Heartland Apartment Complex at 1616 Snow Queen Place. Rosie's described as being a very happy, playful, and loving kid. She loved being outside, she loved playing dress up, getting into her older sister's makeup, and she was just so full of life. Rosie had the cutest laugh, prettiest smile. She just had a cute personality. And she was my sister. She was my bratty sister that I picked on. She loved to dance and listen to music, and everyone says that she had the cutest laugh and prettiest smile. On Saturday, August 12, 1995, Luin and Roberto decided they were going to have a date night, so they left 18-year-old Emilia in charge of Rosie and the two twins. At around dinner time, Rosie decided to go outside and play in the playground that was right in front of the apartment. She frequently played at this playground because there was a lot of families at this complex, so pretty much all the kids would get together at this playground. They would hang out, play, and pretty much everyone knew each other. So Rosie goes outside to play on the playground while Emilia stays inside with the two twins. Some time goes by when Emilia suddenly hears a knock at the door. She goes to see who it is, and a man is standing there carrying Rosie. He tells Emilia that Rosie was playing on the slide when a boy kicked her in the back and she accidentally fell over. So since he saw that Rosie was injured, he decided to pick her up and bring her back home. Now Emilia thought this was pretty strange. She didn't know who this man was and it's just a little bit weird that he decided to just pick up a random child and bring her back to her apartment. So she thought it was weird but she just took Rosie, brought her back into the apartment and as she was closing the front door, she heard the man say, by Rosie and then walk away. Once the man had left, Emilia asked Rosie, how does this man know your name and where did you get injured? And Rosie tells her, I have no idea who he is. I don't know how he knows my name and I also never got injured. So Emilia did think this was weird, but you know, she kind of just shook it off. Rosie wasn't actually injured and she didn't really think much of it and the two girls just continued on with the rest of their night. They ended up playing some games together, watching some movies, and at around 8 p.m., Rosie and the twins went to bed. So Luin and Roberto got home at around 2 o'clock in the morning, and before Luin headed off to bed, she decided to go into Rosie and the twins' bedroom just to check in on them. Everything seemed fine in the bedroom. The twins were sleeping, Rosie was sleeping, everything looked under control. So Luin walked out of the bedroom and left the door open and then headed off to bed. A couple of hours go by, and at around 5 o'clock in the morning, Luin wakes up with a very uneasy feeling. She just feels like something is not right, and and she feels sick to her stomach, so she decides to walk down the hallway and check in on the kids again. When she approaches the children's bedroom, she sees that the door is now closed, which she thought was really weird because when she checked in on them at two o'clock in the morning, she made sure to leave the door open. So she gets inside the bedroom and the twins are still in their bed sleeping. However, when she goes to check on Rosie, Rosie is no longer in bed. She is now gone. Louine quickly glances over the bedroom to see if maybe Rosie's with 
the twins or maybe she's like, you know, somewhere else. But Rosie is nowhere to be found and the bedroom window was wide open. The curtain was also hanging partially on the floor and the window screen had been removed. Immediately, Louis knew that something bad had happened. So she started to scream Rosie's name. She was searching all over the house for Rosie. She went to go wake up her husband, Roberto. She woke up Emilia and told them that Rosie was gone. They all went outside the apartment to look for Rosie and they were shouting her name and panicking, but there was just no sign of Rosie. This is when Louis decided to call 911 and report her daughter as missing. While they were waiting for the police to arrive, Louis called some other family members, told them the situation, and they all headed over and helped search for Rosie. They all fanned out across the apartment complex, walking everywhere they could, screaming Rosie's name. They also made some flyers, and they went knocking door to door, asking if anyone had seen Rosie, but no one had. When police finally arrived to the scene, they first thought that Rosie had wandered off on her own. However, when they went inside of Rosie's bedroom and looked into it a little bit further, their opinion quickly changed. Detectives saw that the window screen had been pulled from the outside of the apartment and the window frame was bent, which made them believe that whoever did this used a tool to prop the screen out. The window treatment was also damaged and the curtain was partially lying on the floor with the imprint of a shoe on it. There was also this dresser underneath the window with a towel on top of it and that towel had that same shoe print on it. So now police were starting to think that maybe Rosie was kidnapped and that she had disappeared somewhere between 2.30 in the morning when Louine checked on her and 5 o'clock in the morning. So police talked to the family, just trying to get some more information about what happened that night, you know, what was Rosie last seen wearing, you know, things like that. And that's when Emilia tells the police about the man that had carried Rosie to the apartment earlier that afternoon. When police hear this story, they immediately knew that it was a lie. They also thought it was weird that this man knew Rosie's name, he knew where Rosie lived, you know, he had the confidence to pick up a child that wasn't his and take her to our apartment. So police were starting to get suspicious of this man and believe believed that he might have made up the story as a ruse to figure out where Rosie lived. One of the avenues under investigation reports that a man was seen hanging around the apartment playground, a man who carried Rosie home Saturday after she fell off the slide. She said that guy was sit sitting on one of the benches just watching the kids. And why would a guy just watch the kids if he didn't have no kids? He's probably seeing who he's going to hit next. Another point that the family made was that Rosie had only been sleeping in that bedroom for a month. And the only people that knew Rosie had changed into this bedroom was her family and close friends. So maybe the man that had brought her from the park had been stalking her and he used this ruse to figure out where Rosie lived and, you know, somehow got her to reveal which bedroom she slept in. Police really believed that, you know, whoever took Rosie had been stalking her for a while because they only went after her. There were two other children in that bedroom, but this person only specifically wanted Rosie. So while police are still at Rosie's house trying to get some fingerprints from the window, one of the officers gets a call on the radio that says, we found a woman's body. Now, Louine was in the same room as these officers, so she also heard this radio call, but she didn't really get too worried because they said they found a woman, not a little girl. So she wasn't too worried, but either way, police headed over to the scene to further investigate. It turns out that a man named Gustavo Ibarra was out for a jog near the canal off the Jordan River. River, which is literally right behind Rosie's apartment and as he was jogging with his dog he saw a body floating in the middle of the canal and called the police on that day I noticed there was something floating in there you can see it's kind of far away to see it and I thought it was a doll a larger doll with a with a dark hair this is a human and it was a darker complexion. That's the only thing I could see on her back. Now, I'm not sure if police had some type of communication and thought that this was a woman, not a little girl, but when police responded to the scene and retrieved the body, they saw that this was in fact six-year-old Rosie Tapia. She was found floating face down and was still in her pajamas. An autopsy was conducted on Rosie and just putting a quick trigger warning out there, what I'm going to describe is pretty disturbing. The autopsy concluded that Rosie was beaten, R-worded, and then drowned to death. It's just horrible. And of course, when Rosie's family heard the news, I mean, they were completely heartbroken. They didn't even know how to react to the news because, I mean, who would do something so evil and horrible to a child? 
And when I checked her body, you know, I wanted to hold her and they wouldn't let me pick her up. But I knew that she suffered, you know, but I didn't know exactly the type of um, injuries she had until I read the medical report. And the more I read it, I it just broke my heart that she had to suffer the way she did. And why would anybody want to hurt a little girl like that? I just can't understand that. So now that police found Rosie's body and knew that she was murdered, they began to talk to people in the apartment complex, people near the canal, you know, people in the area to see if anybody noticed anybody suspicious that morning. And someone did. A witness that lived in the same apartment complex came forward and said he was up early that morning and saw a teenager coming from the same direction as the canal. At first he thought the teenager was wearing pants with two different colors, but then he realized that his pants were actually wet. With this information, police were convinced that the killer lived near the area and knew the layout of the family's home. Maybe Rosie was familiar with the abductor and when he went inside the bedroom, he woke up Rosie and she cooperated without a fuss and then he took her out the window, which was really hard for the family to hear. I mean, they were already super heartbroken and devastated by the death of Rosie, but then to find out that someone could have been stalking this six-year-old child and trying to figure out where she lived and just watching her just made them feel sick to their stomach. As devastated as they were, the family knew that they had to remain strong and continue to search for Rosie's killer. So detectives asked the family, do you know who could have done this? And Luin says that her husband Roberto had a friend who also had a son the same age as Rosie. This friend and his son would often come over for play dates and he knew that Rosie had switched into the new bedroom. Now Luin says that while they were searching the banks of the canal, people said that this friend was getting a little bit nervous and when they approached where Rosie's body was later found, he told people to turn back and search some Somewhere else. It seemed as if he didn't want to go further up the canal because maybe he knew that Rosie's body was there. So the people in the search party and the family thought his behavior was really strange and police did look into him extensively. They spoke to his ex-wife at the time and she confirmed that when Rosie was murdered, he was at home sleeping in bed. He also had a clean police record. He had no history of criminal offenses, no history of sexual offenses. So for now, police have cleared him. After this, police began to interview anybody that lived at the apartment complex and seemed suspicious, but nothing came up. So the family did hold a funeral for Rosie, and it was just very hard for them to know that, you know, the six-year-old little girl lost her life in such a horrific way. After the funeral, the family buried Rosie, and a lot of people would show up to her grave and leave her notes, stuffed animals, gifts, flowers, and someone even left her a Barbie doll. Loeen thought that this was very sweet of people to do, so she collected all of these items and put them in a box. You know, the family did have a lot of support from the community and other neighbors living in that same complex. Everyone was pretty shaken up and people were scared for their children's safety. It's just so sad because somebody could be so sick to take a baby from her room, from her security and do such a rotten thing to her. What are we supposed to do? Keep our kids locked up, our windows locked, our doors locked, put bars on our window to keep our kids from being stolen and, and tossed in a river? The Salt Lake City police searched and searched for new clues, new evidence, you know, anything that could help the case, but they found nothing. Years would go by and Rosie's case would remain unsolved. In 2015, Rosie's little brother told Two News that the night Rosie was kidnapped, he had seen a man with a beard inside the bedroom. This man was just standing in the corner and he told him to just go back to sleep and he did. Now, some people don't really know if they can trust what the little brother is saying because at the time he was only four years old and it wasn't until years later, you know, in 2015, that he revealed this information to the police. It could be true, but some people think it could be part of his imagination. So to this day, police have really never confirmed his statement. 
After Rosie's brother came forward with the statement, another year went by without any movement in the case. This is when detectives started to theorize that maybe Rosie's killer was caught on camera. They believe this person may possibly be seen in some of the news footage from 1995. Detective Greg Wilkins said, A lot of the times, people that commit these crimes end up watching what's going on, watching the news reports, or actually go back to the scene. So maybe Rosie's killer was a part of the search team. Maybe he showed up to some of the vigils. Maybe he attended Rosie's funeral. Maybe he showed up to her grave. You know, there is a lot of cases where the killer tries to inject themselves in the investigation or often goes back to the crime scene to, you know, see what's going on and in a gross way kind of, you know, relive the crime. In fact, one of Rosie's childhood friends came forward a few years after the and said that she was watching a news report about Rosie and she recognized a man in the footage from 1995. She says that this man sat and watched her and Rosie play on the playground a few days before her murder. Now, she doesn't really remember what news station she was watching, but she says she recognized this man. So now police are asking all Salt Lake City TV stations to come forward with any news that they produced in 1995 about Rosie's death. It's just crazy that Rosie's killer may possibly be in one of these videos. So then, once again, a few more years go by without any movement in Rosie's case. In 2017, Kara Porter, who is an attorney that represents the Tapia family, announced that she and the Utah Cold Case Coalition were joining the search for Rosie's killer. If you're not familiar with the Utah Cold Case Coalition, they are a nonprofit organization led by Jason Jensen and co founded by Kara Porter, and their goal is to solve cold cases. I actually mentioned them in the past when I did my video on Elizabeth Salgado. If you guys haven't heard about Elizabeth's case, I will link it down below so you guys can go check it out. So, once the Utah Cold Case Coalition joined the case, they quickly realized that the witness from 1995 that told police he saw a teenager leaving the canal with wet pants was never formally interviewed or sat down with the sketch artist. Like what? Like how are you not going to interview the one person that could have potentially seen Rosie's killer leaving the scene? But Detective Jason Jensen thought this was crazy and he immediately got in contact with the witness and sat him down with a sketch artist. Now this witness wants to remain anonymous but he described the teenager as a 16 to 17 year old Hispanic boy with a slight build and a narrow face with high cheekbones. He was wearing denim jeans, a white shirt, and a medium length gold chain. I think this sketch would have been so helpful back in 1995 when this case had just happened and people had fresh eyes, but now releasing this information in 2019, I just feel like it's not as helpful because by this point, you know, people's memories have faded. So it's just crazy that it took so many years for this sketch to be made. Now, when people saw that this sketch was of a teenager, a lot of people started to theorize that maybe the abductor was one of Emilia's friends. Jason says that he learned that in 1995, friends of Rosie's older sister Emilia used to use the window to visit Emilia at night. So he believes that this person of interest may be one of Emilia's friends, someone that knew they could sneak into the house through that specific window. In fact, when the sketch of this teenager was released, a man named Danny Woodland came forward and admitted to sneaking into the bedroom back in 1995 to visit Emilia. So when he heard of Rosie's death, he thought that police were going to interview him since he frequently snuck through the window, but they never did. But when the sketch was released in 2019, Danny texted one of his friends that he used to hang out with in 1995 and that would go visit Emilia with him and said, that looks like you, dude. The friend replied with, no, that ain't me. It looks more like you than it did me. Well, when Detective Jason heard about this, he called back the witness who saw the teenager walking from the canal back in 1995, and he did a photo lineup that included a photo of Danny's friend. Well, this witness picked out Danny's friend from the lineup. So now there's two people that believe this man could be the one from the sketch. Now this friend says he had nothing to do with Rosie's and police did go talk to him, but they haven't released any information about what they talked to him about, you know, if he had a clear alibi for that night or really any information. So they're kind of keeping it hush hush for now. So I don't really know what the follow up is with that, but if I do find any new information, I will keep you guys posted in the comment section down below. To this day, April of 2022, Rosie Tapia's killer has never been caught. 
On the 25th anniversary of her death, the family and members of the Utah Cold Case Coalition announced a new initiative in Rosie's honor called the Rosie Tapia Identification Project. Through this project, the coalition's forensic DNA laboratory will offer free DNA testing and genetic genealogy to identify all the unidentified bodies found in Utah, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. They're hoping that with this project, they can help police identify these bodies and bring closure to the families. They're also trying to pass Rosie's Law, which requires law enforcement agencies statewide to share information on any unsolved missing person or homicide case. They also added a reward to every single unsolved case in Utah, and they're doing this so that people have an incentive to come forward with information about these cases. And the reason Rosie's family wanted to start this project and wanted to get her law passed is because, you know, they're dealing with it firsthand. Rosie was murdered back in 1995, and to this day, the family's still doesn't have any answers or any type of closure. Whoever killed Rosie is just free and living their life and they probably think that they're never going to get caught and the family wants them to know that they will. They will not stop fighting until this person is caught and is punished for what they did. For a while, there really wasn't any movement in Rosie's case until Detective Jason Jensen became aware of the items left on Rosie's grave a few days after she was murdered. So remember how earlier I mentioned that after they buried Rosie, a lot of people would show up to her grave to leave her flowers, balloons, gifts, you know, things like that. Well, one of those items was a Barbie Pretty Heart stall, and the Utah Cold Case Coalition believes that there is a specific reason why this Barbie was left there. They made a statement saying, I can just say there were two things, two factors about the Barbie doll that led us to believe it needed to be tested, and I can't go into further detail than that. A few days after Rosie's passing, there was items that were left on her gravesite. Um, so I just gathered them up and took them home. It's a Sweetheart's Barbie that was uh, manufactured in 1994. Maybe Rosie's killer went to go visit the gravesite and left the Barbie there. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of killers do like to go back to the crime scene or sometimes will go visit where the victim was buried and leave gifts or, you know, just visit and look at their victim again. So it's possible that the killer did leave this Barbie. They were able to extract testable amounts of DNA from the Barbie and the Cold Case Coalition is willing to pay for a private lab to test the DNA and see if a match appears. However, before they go through with this, they did want to let the public know about this Barbie and see if the person who put the Barbie on Rosie's grave will come forward. If somebody will come forward, Um, and say, I know who left that there or I left that there and we may be able to confirm that and that might save those resources. So we'll see what happens with that. I will keep you guys posted if there's any updates about this Barbie, if they do end up doing further DNA testing or if someone does come forward and admit that they left the Barbie there. I will let you guys know, but hopefully this Barbie does lead to some answers and can hopefully provide the family with some type of closure. It's now been over 26 years since Rosie was murdered, and every year, Rosie's family marks this sad anniversary by visiting her grave. Louine brings her grandchildren now, some lounge chairs, they bring balloons, flowers, and photos of Rosie, and just reflect on her life. She would be 32 years old now, and they like to think about what Rosie would be like as an adult. What career would she have? Would she have gotten married? Would she have had kids? You know, they just like to think about, you know, who Rosie would have grown up to be. Louine says, All I want to do is solve her case before something happens to me. It doesn't get easier, it gets harder because with Rosie, I feel like we're not getting anywhere in her case. Unfortunately, in 2020, Rosie's older sister Emilia passed away. So now Louine is dealing with the loss of two daughters and I just cannot imagine what she's feeling. I mean, she is just such an incredibly strong person and my heart goes out to Louine and the rest of the Tapia family. It's even more heartbreaking because for so many years, Emilia lived with so much guilt. She was the one babysitting Rosie the night she was murdered and she just has so much guilt and, you know, questions everything she did that night. She wonders why she didn't stay awake with Rosie, why she didn't let Rosie sleep on the couch with her like Rosie originally wanted, why she didn't join Rosie in bed, why she didn't hear anything. What did I do wrong? What didn't I pay attention to? What did I, why 
when I was watching her, you know? Did I walk by the person that was planning this, you know? Why was it, why did I stay awake? Why did I leave the TV on? Because it seemed like as soon as we turned the TV on, that's when they striked, you know, as soon as they knew we were all going to sleep. Maybe I should have let her sleep out in the living room with me. She would have been here, you know? On top of the guilt she was already feeling, a lot of people thought that Emilia may have been lying about what really happened that night. Some have said that she hosted a party the night Rosie died and that perhaps a guest from the party saw Rosie and later went back to the house to kidnap her. However, Detective Jason says he doesn't really buy that idea because there would have been evidence that a party had occurred that night. Plus, he says that if a party had actually happened, Emilia would have come forward and given any information that could help the case. She really had no reason to hide this information, so on top of her already feeling guilty by her actions that night, she also had to deal with people blaming her and accusing her of lying and, you know, maybe trying to hide something. So, so I just feel really bad for Emilia. And again, my heart goes out to Luin and to the rest of the Tapia family. I'm so sorry about your loss and I really hope that you guys have some type of answers and closure soon. And that's pretty much it, you guys. That's all the information I have on today's case. Here's a description that Emilia gave of the man that carried Rosie to the apartment the night she disappeared. And here is a sketch that the witness made of the teenager that was seen walking from the canal the morning after Rosie was murdered. Again, if you guys have any information about this case or remember anything, you know, even if it's just a small detail, please come forward and contact the Salt Lake City Police Department or the Utah Cold Case Coalition. The family also has a website called whokilledrosie.com where they post updates about the case and there's also a tip line you can call if you have any information. One of the phone numbers on the website is only answered by representatives of the family, not the police. So if you do want to speak to the police directly, you can call the numbers on the screen and I will have more information about that link down below. Hopefully someone out there knows something, but again, I will keep you guys posted on any new movement in the case. All right, you guys, that's pretty much all I have for this video. Thank you guys so much for being here and listening to Rosie's case. I really appreciate it. And again, if you guys have any case suggestions, you guys can submit them through my case suggestion form linked down below. And yeah, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.